Hey everybody, Joe Klimzeski and Adam Atkinson back at you with another Contest Prep University feature. This time we're going to talk about supplements, which obviously is a, is a very broad topic, but I, th I thought I would start, Adam, by explaining a little bit about what I think is a pretty acute history of bodybuilding supplements. I was in college when we still only had one protein powder brand out there, Joe Weider. And it was this pasty stuff that had the texture of just baking flour. And it tasted so rancid, so bad. You had to, in the locker room after your workout, put this in a shaker cup. And literally, I mean, I would stand at the sink and plug my nose as I chugged this just in case I was going to throw up. And then, very shortly after that, comes Dr. Scott Connolly, the founder of Metrics who created a protein powder with artificial sweeteners and some palatability. Uh, he, of course, did some early work in collaborative marketing with Bill Phillips of Muscle Media 2000 at that time. And along came Anthony Almada, who had a master's degree in some you know, nutritional sciences, I believe, and created the company Experimental and Applied Sciences, EAS, which, of course, Bill Phillips saw the writing on the wall, bought that company, started researching things like creatine, HMB, and the sports supplement company just exploded. But prior to that, as even a young teenager, I remember at 12, 13, 14 years old, reading Muscle and Fitness, reading Flex Magazine. And because there was just no money to be made, this industry didn't yet exist, they would have articles on, hey, vitamin E can help you recover. So I would take my allowance down to the, the local health food store and buy vitamin E. And, oh, vitamin B, you'll have a great workout. If you want a good pre-workout supplement, take vitamin B. It's good for your nervous system, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's all there was. And now, especially because creatine had so much impact, it paved the way for the industry to start creating causal or reactive supplements. Instead of these nutritional supplements, vitamins, protein, things like that, amino acids, that your body actually needs for certain functions, and you can order, you can argue better recovery and so forth, you know, this turn where you could promise better performance, supra physiological results, again, floodgates were open, and now it's this you know, multi, multi, tens of billions of dollar industry, just where people like me when I was a kid would go buy supplements that they think are going to give them results far, far better than without them. So I know we're going to talk about things in different categories, uh, but just, just the whole concept of supplements. I know you and I agree that, you know, use, use some judicial discretion in what you're going to spend your money on look for what has some true science uh, besides different types of mechanistic studies that really test these for safety and effectiveness. But, you know, uh, will there be some some studies in the future that show you didn't really need that? And, and I've got a handful of examples like that. But, you know, those are my introductory remarks. I'd love to hear yours, Adam. Yeah, I think you started off in a great fashion here with you know, what is the absolute need for some of these things? And when companies promote these things, they promote it as if you need them. You know, you'll have a great workout. You'll feel better. Uh, a lot of times it comes down to, are you even deficient in what they're offering? Uh, you know, our bodies naturally make creatine, but, you know, to get that super physiological level that's beneficial, it's great to supplement with it. I think that's one of my number one supplements always to this day that hasn't really changed much over the past 10 years. Uh, the only reason I maybe don't put people on it is the, if they're a little bit afraid of the weight gain and their initial goal is to lose weight, People get fixated on the scale. It may not be the best timing to add it right when someone starts a diet because they feel like their efforts are a loss. So, you know, I, I think also, too, what's causing the deficiency in the first place? I think we always look for what can we take to fix these things, but what's causing this issue in the first place? So, 
you know, if you're not sleeping and you're only sleeping like four hours a night, a sleep supplement, yes, you may get deeper sleep, but the cause is, gosh, you probably need to double your sleep, you know? Really good example on that one. I mean, you just you just hit home because <laughs> my, my <laughs> wife struggles with this, and we've tried some different things. And, and, and to your point, like, well, maybe you're taking caffeine too late. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep. Maybe you're a little too anxious. Maybe you need to create some kind of a meditative routine at the end of the night. You know, less screen time with those you know blue light elements. So, yes, you know, look for those things. Um, I, I also want to key in on what you said about creatine having having a really good impact that you can measure, that's tangible, most studied supplement in history. A lot of people make the mistake thinking, if I take this supplement, I'm going to get X results and therefore they stay. I have now achieved that. But even creatine, which simply helps your body resynthesize ATP back into muscle cells so that you can get one or two extra reps per set, you get a little more extra, you know, intracellular hydration, which can help facilitate protein synthesis. You get all of these things, but just like you don't drink water one day and now you're good for the rest of the week, you have to keep ingesting that. You, you get that effect. So, uh, you know, if if I decided that all of this great progress that creatine helps me make, and it does, like I remember in the 90s taking it for the first time. And just the muscular hardness and fullness from that that hydration, the extra strength you felt in the gym that was way beyond placebo, that's real. But does it cause more accumulation of lean body mass over time, you know, other than whatever you can get acutely? No. Or we'd all be walking around 600 pounds of pure muscle, right? Like, we, we, you don't retain that. It's a supplement that keeps you progressing forward in those goals, in those mechanistic ways of your, your training. But then just like vitamin C, water-soluble vitamin, you, you need to keep taking it. So so I, I think, you know, if, if we look at things that you can become deficient in, even from a micronutrition perspective, and then look at some of these performance supplements, like, you know, let's throw, let's throw caffeine in the same bucket as creatine again. I want a great workout. I know the ergogenic effects of creatine. I've got to take creatine before every workout, every workout that I want that effect. That's an okay example of using a supplement that has value for what you are about to do. But I think we need to rein back the expectations that we're really spending our money on things that are going to give us cumulative progress that, that stays forever. Yeah, absolutely. You know, vitamin D is probably one of my most recommended. Uh, you know, people say you need more sun, but truthfully, you really don't absorb that much through the sun anyhow. So it's the most common deficiency I see on blood work uh, almost immediately. People seem to be, you know, right at like 32 and I think 39 is the low range. So you don't want to be over 100 and a lot of people do need to supplement with that one. And, you know, how feasible would it be to tell someone to stand out in the sun for three hours a day? They may not live somewhere where that's feasible. And uh, it's just not something that we get through nutrition, uh, you know. So it's something that we definitely add in. Um, I recently think of my client who had a iron deficiency. So we actually gave her vitamin C so she would absorb more heme irons with a little bit of iron. Uh, but it, it's great you mentioned micronutrition because that's a possibility. But when you look up what she would have needed to take for vitamin C from food, she would need like 14 oranges a day and her macronutrient intake wouldn't have really made that feasible. So there are cases where you truly do need these things for at least a short amount of time to get you out of the deficit that you're in. And, you know, when bodybuilders do low calorie diets, which you should to get lean enough for a stage, you, you tend to dig a hole in some of these things that you need because you're just not eating that much. Yeah. And, and your turn toward vitamins there, I, I appreciate because it's a topic that I think a lot of people have some confusion 
And we went through an era of mega dosing where the, you know, quote, natural or holistic community, you know, was all touting, you know, just massive amounts of these things. Like here's, here's the toxic level. So as long as you're not above that, you're good. You need this. But they didn't count on receptor site affinity, receptor site degradation. Uh, the fact that there it is a limit to how much you can absorb at one time. So we've talked about this in the past, but for example, not enough vitamin C, you get scurvy and other issues. If you get too much per dose, you can it can actually become uh, toxic in terms of increasing your risk of, of cancers. Same thing with vitamin E. A certain amount of vitamin E reduces your risk of heart disease. Too much vitamin E increases your risk of heart disease. So I, I think it's important to, to consider we don't need mega dosing. We don't even need everything every day. Even something like vitamin D in my vitamin cabinet, you know, maybe I take 2000 IUs a couple times a week, or especially when it's not sunny out, I may take it more often. Like I'm thinking what my body may need, but I'm also strategically, intentionally intermittent. Because anything you just take around the clock every single day, even something like calcium, you, you get your body levels up to a place where it needs, you're, you're, you're not deficient. And so you literally just excrete most of what you're taking in. And again, you start having to deal with receptor site affinity issues. So making your body need it once in a while to resensitize receptor sites is actually a good idea. Yeah. And that's like anything you take, you know, your body is kind of protective on the absorption of these things. And there's also even genetic mutations where, you know, people have something like MTHFR where they don't absorb normal B vitamins. So they need um, methylation or a methyl donor to absolutely absorb that. So, you know, not saying no on the supplements, but the, it can get really overwhelming. And I think at least twice a year, I get a client where they just, I wonder how they even afford it, you know, and they've got maybe 30 things listed. And I said, you know, how much of these do you need? Because you've actually suffered the detriments of maybe lack of sleep or, you know, do you really need this special seaweed supplement? Like, tell me what you think the benefits are for that, because sometimes I don't even know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I, I know. mean, you, you, so it's funny you say that because in my supplement cabinet, of which I really do enjoy researching and reading and shopping and finding novel things because, wow, there's there's a noted. I always look for good citations and I want to make sure there's some validity and some safety studies. But I'll say, okay, obviously, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to take everything every day, but to say, even if it's something once a week, once a month, there there is a lot of research that shows the value in things like this. I, I always cite one study that showed just one dose of, of fish oil or a meal with a, a an omega-3 rich fatty acid fish per week reduces Alzheimer's risk by 90%. Just by having it once a week, you don't need fish oil capsules with every single meal every single day, but that's that's the kind of mentality I think we all need to have is that, you know, look for all of these things that are very unique to our physiology. We're not going to get them in our topographical domain like we would something else, but, you know, get them infrequently, you know, expose your body to them. And I think you're giving yourself a nice little bit of insurance that way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's you know, things that I typically don't live without or, you know, vitamin D. And then I typically, you know, do take a multivitamin, but I only take it about five times a week. So weekends are usually off just to make sure I don't overdo anything that I don't necessarily need. And I do know that I don't even use all of that. I can usually tell through the weekdays, I'm definitely urinating out those vitamins, but you know, it, it's better to have what I'm deficient in coming in versus not. So it's more for protection. I, I have been keeping my supplements relatively minimal aside from the vitamin D for quite some time now. So let's turn to some big ones in the bodybuilding world. And, and I'll start with 
protein, and then maybe we can switch over to some of the more current relevant, uh, you know, single fill type supplements. But here's a great example. A coach of mine who is also a client asked me this morning, like, hey, my gym over here in Europe is trying to sell me on IV drip amino acid treatments. Because after I work out, if I could just lay there for 20 or 30 minutes with this IV in my arm, of course, with them charging me appropriately, I'm going to have better recovery. And I said, okay, let's think about a couple things. You know, first of all, the amount of amino acid you need to reach a protein synthesis threshold, usually as you would ingest that in your stomach, we, we measure that. And there have been recent studies and meta-analyses that show depending on your body size and the context environmentally, did you just work out? Did you just wake up? How long between meals? All that sort of thing. You know, there, there is a minimum threshold. You need 15, 20, 25. I'm giving you a broad range of, of grams of protein to really get into that positive blood nitrogen balance to have an impact. But then how much is too much where now you're just excreting it, converting it to glucose or fat, et cetera, Again, very, very situational. But will that IV drip get you to that minimum threshold? You know, are you really going to get 25 grams worth of protein in those amino acids? Because gram for gram, amino acids are the same as protein. It would take 25 grams of, for example, branched chain amino acids or essential amino acids to get 25 grams of protein. So I said, I doubt that. Plus, if you just drink a protein shake, because that's a liquid meal that gets physically to the bottom of your stomach quickly, where, you know, you're going to start getting some um, leakage into your duodenum of your small intestine and start getting some absorption, that IV is probably only beating a protein shake by about 30 seconds to starting to see any elevation in blood amino acids. Then is that even necessary? Because we've also seen research that, that that anabolic window really could be about two hours. So do you really need that immediate IV stick? And then you also have uh, research showing, as, as we just talked about, that some protein fasts, you know, that the times that you don't get what you need, so your receptor sites get a little more sensitive to it, you could be degrading the efficiency of how your body ingests and assimilates protein by constantly doing that, giving it such an immediate supply. So again, I gave her four or five layers to think through of why that's cool, like great, yay us, we have an amino acid drip we can give somebody if they need it, like a hiker who was just rescued, you know, after four days lost in the mountains, we can put a saline solution right in their arm as an EMT in an ambulance, to start rehydrating them and so forth. But is it worth the money? Is it worth the needle stick? Is it, it's just, it's just not. And so all the way backing up to just a protein powder supplement, do I need that instead of just more chicken or egg whites or cottage cheese? No, but it's convenient. Sometimes it tastes better. Um, absorption could be a little bit quicker. So there may be some utility so I think these are the kind of questions we have to get used to asking ourselves before we just go buy something else. Yeah, that stuff's marketed really heavily now, especially out here in Las Vegas. We're seeing, you know, I think Las Vegas and Florida tend to really come out with these things right away. And, you know, my my argument was by the time they stick you with the needle, you probably could have consumed a protein shake in that amount of time anyhow, or even just an amino acid shake if you really wanted that instead. Yeah, so so here, here's the answer. Show me a, a human randomized control trial that shows that that is better than the protein shake, that that is better than the chicken breast, that the immediacy is necessary. Show me all of those levels with, with every 15 minute blood draws for the next three to six hours with a good enough subject group. And then show me longitudinally why that even matters. Did that person actually gain more lean body mass over the next six months by doing that every time? Like, you know, there are different levels to the research that I would need to see before we even decide that that's useful. Just like when essential amino acids and branch chains and even single fill like, like leucine started coming out, 
like, yeah, you can do this. And if you just take five grams of branch chains, that's, that's equivalent to 20 grams of protein powder. And now you can just do this and you can get it in your body faster. That's, that's all true. But when research came out and showed, ah, eh, it doesn't really matter. Like it didn't actually change anything in anybody's results. Then you have to say, okay, well, maybe there's still some usefulness because I just like having a branch chain amino drink instead of a bolus of protein, you know, you know, from whole food or protein powder. So yeah, I mean, it still may be there, but you just have to know what you're buying and why. Yeah, absolutely. So, so give me a handful or maybe just, you know, things that come to mind of current supplements that may be hot and popular uh, or have come and gone, J just things that you tell clients, hey, this, this still is useful. I think this has promised. This is good for this reason. What are some of the things you like and what are some of the things that maybe you say don't waste your time with? I definitely can say creatine's my number one. Uh, vitamin D, I'm almost always giving those to my clients. Um, in the competing world with females, um, I really like Boron. It's a great micro mineral, and it's really great for prevention of osteoporosis. It can actually breed testosterone levels a little bit, which is nice if those hormones are bound up. So. I find that those are really good for a little extra bang for your buck for not a lot of money. But uh, the one that I'm really skeptical on is uh, collagen right now because it's not even a complete protein. And it always seems like that is the one that my clients buy without me even suggesting it. And I'll see it on their supplement sheet. And, you know, when I look at the prices of it, it's... I would almost rather them just buy a protein powder in general or, or at least a glutamine that would actually, you know, deliver some better recovery and, you know, um, better, you know, better benefit than what collagen would. And uh, it would be cheaper in the long run, too. Mm -hmm. So th there are obviously pre-workouts that we like for the ergogenic effects that I mentioned in, in terms of workout capacity. Uh, they, they tend to also add a lot of things like nitric oxide and so forth that have a, have a discernible effect. You know, you could, you can say, wow, that's, that's impressive. I feel that. Um, are, are there any other things that you like to recommend pre and post workout for training effectiveness as well as recovery? You know, when food intake gets higher, I don't mind if my clients consume some kind of carb powder. Um, but typically I'll use Gatorade just because it's cheap and easy and just the Gatorade powder. Um, because I, I'm not sold on these fast acting like cyclic dextrins or anything like that. Because to me, a carb is a carb at the end of the day. And I, I do understand that those present less of a gut load than like if you were to consume food but so does sugar too and you know yes you're trying to consume enough carbs that you're not dividing the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system and i think that's where sugar really has its place when people are maybe struggling to eat a little bit just maybe they're struggling to hit their food intake for the day I think that during workout feeding um, with a little bit of sugar can be a really beneficial place to put it because they're usually pretty hungry post-workout anyhow. So that's a great window of opportunity for an extra feeding if calories allow. Yeah, a another great example because what you just said there is, you know, if you were going to get into dextrose, dectrins, maltodextrose, all these different things, because of, quote, the expediency, you know, how quickly they digest and get assimilated. Well, how much faster is it really than having something like Gatorade, which is a good, great supplement? Like that is a research supplement where the vitamins, minerals, electrolytes have a balanced value that hydrate your cells better than water. Um, but, you know, pre-workout to grab a granola bar, a cereal bar, or even just, you know, let's say 90 minutes ago, you had a whole food meal with something like rice, like maybe you just don't need that. And so to spend your money on a fancy supplement just may not be effective. It's not giving you anything. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking of when you were, you were talking there is 
uh, e even something like glutamine that had its heyday, you know, like everybody wanted that for recovery. The sales taglines were it's, you know, glutamine makes up 60% of your muscular content from an amino acid perspective. It's, it's carbohydrate glycogen sparing, which makes it lean body mass sparing. And the fact that your body will use that first as an energy source. So great supplement it. But then we ran into the research issues. Well, gosh, it takes, you know, at least eight grams just to get through the epithelial lining of your gut because those cells are using it too. So now you need to take this much and then how much are you really getting? And then do you get more of it that way than if you just had regular protein sources and enough protein per day? So those are the things I, I keep coming back to just looking for real research and seeing if there is tested value for the purposes that we want that supplement. And that really shrinks the list down quite a bit in, in terms of what we'll, we'll end up taking. Do you have favorite websites that you like to look at? I know I like to use Examine a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very, very good. I, you know, right now I just tend to do searches in a search engine like Google because if I'm looking at a certain supplement and I, I do a search there, I will get PubMed links, Google Scholar links, you know, maybe to, you know, if Examine is, is highly rated in, in the algorithm, like, you know, you'll get a broader spectrum uh, there are definitely places that, you know, especially these may not be as relevant now, but places like consumerlab.com, there were some other ones where you can look at actual testing, safety testing and efficacy. Examine, I think, is one of the sites that has really taken that role in, in the modern era. But, I, I you know, just just use use any type of search engine and maybe AI assistance as you can just to see what's there. Certainly you know, not just influencers and social media, uh, but look for, look for real scientists who have done some due diligence. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, man. Um, anything that you don't think we covered? I mean, it's, it's silly that supplements as a topic is so large, but I at least want to make sure we hit the things that people may be considering right now. Yeah, I think we covered everything. I mean, there's obviously a really dark side with fixing diseases and stuff like that. Um, but there are some that, you know, where supplements are used for treatments of certain diseases, but it's usually like a certain ingredient. Um, you know, those are always tough to see because you see people, you know, kind of selling hope and uh, taking advantage of somebody in a rough spot, you know. Yeah, well, well, clearly, guys, we're not going to answer every question here, but you can always feel free to leave them in the comment sections and we'll hit those. And uh, we will see you next time in Contest Prep University. <laughs>